We have our keynote speaker. He's just arrived, Dr. Matt Budoff. Of course, it'll have to be a bit of an abbreviated uh, presentation, but he's pretty used to that. So without further ado, your keynote speaker, Dr. Matt Budoff. Thank you. So sorry to be late. Uh, comedy of, of errors here. But uh, anyway, let me uh, get rolling here. Um, so I'll be uh, go through our introduction. So let me first just introduce the tool we use to measure plaque. Uh, this is uh, how we quantify atherosclerosis with a CTN geography. It's a non-invasive test, a little IV. We inject contrast into the coronary arteries, and we can see not only how tight a blockage is in the form of stenosis, but through making three-dimensional pictures, we can look at the number of lesions, we can look at the plaque volume, how much plaque is present in each segment of each coronary artery, and we can look at the overall uh, coronary tree. So the combination of these things gives us the opportunity to quantify plaque and then follow patients over time with this tool. So the, the keto match, uh, um, what we did is we had a baseline study of 100 participants. Um, this, is the, this is the intro slide, but uh, funded by the Citizen Science Foundation. Thank you. Thank you all, especially to uh, Dave and Nick and others who really put this together. Um, so uh, so we, we know this um, issue, right? We have patients who adopt a, a keto, a carbohydrate restricted keto diet uh, for any reason, and their LDL may go up. Uh, usually uh, the, the lipids get better in many patients if they're obese or have diabetes, but the lean pa patients tend to exhibit uh, uh, increases in LDL and sometimes extreme increases in LDL cholesterol. And it's been of great controversy whether this is dangerous or whether this is just another way of metabolizing uh, energy in this uh, ketogenic uh, state. So we uh, looked at these patients um, with uh, uh, high uh, HDL, low triglycerides, and very high LDL cholesterol. We excluded patients who had genetic predisposition for high cholesterol, what we call familial hypercholesterolemia, and um, we uh, excluded patients who didn't have a normal cholesterol before they got into the trial. So they had to have normal cholesterol, no abnormalities, go on a ketogenic diet, and then have this extreme response, and that's the population we studied. The aim of the study is to prospectively evaluate plaque progression over the course of one year in 100 metabolically healthy lean mass hyperresponders. Uh, and uh, here's the baseline characteristics. We matched this against a population-based study. So we took a study called Miami Heart. They did CT angiographies, also read by me in my lab. Um, in a population of patients, just a random sampling. So we have a population-based patients, asymptomatic people. We looked at their plaque, and we looked, compared it to the plaque in our baseline characteristics of the lean mass hyperresponders. Now, lean mass hyperresponders are not familial hypercholesterolemia. FH, as we call it, is born with a high cholesterol um, and uh, unrelated to uh, their HDL and triglycerides may be high, may be low, um, but they know they have cardiovascular risk because they've lived with high cholesterol and, and not in a metabolically healthy state for many, many years. Uh, lean mass hyperresponders induced by diet and otherwise very healthy, metabolically healthy with a very good, good cholesterol, HDL above 80, and a very normal and low triglycerides, so a much different population. So we took these patients. Now, we have 100 in the trial. We were only able to match 80 in the Miami Heart trial because of age restrictions in that study compared to the population that we studied. But now we're going to compare 80 patients of our lean mass hyperresponders to patients exactly the same, same age, gender, race, diabetes, hypertension, all the risk factors except for LDL cholesterol. And we're going to see if they're different. 
Here's our baseline characteristics, and I think you can appreciate ages are identical, um, the uh, ethnicity is identical, cholesterol is going to be different because of the lean mass hyperresponders. The average LDL was 272, right? Normal for an asymptomatic person is 130, uh, and compare that to 123 in the patients in Miami Heart. Blood pressures were perfectly the same. Uh, C-reactive protein inflammation was the same. Hemoglobin A1C, their, their predisposition to diabetes was the same. So everything else matched up very nicely. So <coughs> we looked at um, this population and there were no differences, I'll show you a moment, but no significant differences in plaque between these patients with the Miami Heart Controls, LDL of 123, and the ketogenic uh, patients um, uh, well, with an LDL of, um, oh, wait, that's pre-LDL, sorry, with an LDL of 273. So these are the, this is the comparison, this is the primary results of these 80 patients. The calcium score, quantified plaque in the coronary arteries, score of zero in keto, score of one in the Miami heart, so no difference, p-value not statistically significant, Total stenosis score, zero on average. The median was zero in the keto group. They had, on average, no significant plaque. And a score of one, an average of one in the Miami Heart, no statistical difference. Total plaque score, this is where we're gonna start getting into our total plaque quantification. On average, zero in keto and one in the Miami Heart, no statistical difference. And how many segments were involved in the coronary tree on average zero with keto and one with Miami Heart. None of these were statistically different, but you can see even keto kind of trended on the better side of that. Higher numbers are more plaque and more stenosis. Now we're gonna do quantitative plaque. We're gonna get all plaque quantification and that's undergoing, that's being done right now. But at least at baseline, these groups looked very similar. Now we looked at the LDL versus the plaque score. So this is increasing LDL. These are the LDL values of the patients, and here's the plaque that we saw in the lean mass hyperresponders. There was no relationship. If there was a relationship, you would expect a line like this, where a higher LDL was associated with more plaque, and we don't see that. Same thing with Miami Heart. The LDLs are lower, 123 instead of 272, but no direct relationship. So LDL didn't predict plaque in the coronary arteries. We then looked at um, total plaque score and LDL, just another analysis, again, increasing LDL, increasing total plaque score, and again, no relationship in keto, no relationship in Miami Heart. So the LDL did not drive plaque in the keto diet. In other words, patients who had a more significant hyper response, LDLs of 400, 500, 600 milligrams per deciliter, did not have more plaque. The, these patients had zero, the patients at the far extreme here. So no direct relationship between higher LDL induced by the ketogenic diet and plaque in the coronary arteries. Uh, I'm not going to go through the mechanism uh, for the sake of time, but this goes back to a wonderful paper written by uh, Nick Norwitz and Dave Feldman, um, uh, published uh, talking about the potential energy model and why why you may get an increase in LDL, a decrease in triglycerides, and an improvement in HDL, good cholesterol, when you're in a ketogenic state. Um, so the, I wanted to show you, not everybody with high LDL automatically develops heart disease, even in familial hypercholesterolemia. Remember, we said this is not FH. But even if you looked at a population of patients with FH, they had a no plaque at all, calcium score of zero in 6,000 patients born with high LDL, and 5,000 patients had some plaque present. So LDL by itself, not always a driving force. You need other factors probably that, that help uh, drive this forward and give us a, a increased cardiovascular risk. And when they didn't have coronary calcium, there was no increase in myocardial infarction and if they didn't have uh, uh, coronary calcium, even if they had high LDL above 193 for life, they didn't have increased risk of having a heart attack, stroke, or cardiac death. So the, we um, looked back at the 
duration of high LDL in the population we studied in the patient, these 100 patients, and the mean duration was 4.7 years. <coughs> this is at baseline, so at follow-up now, we're gonna have 5.7 years, and we finished the follow-up scans. We're still analyzing them, but we're gonna have 5.7 years duration of elevated LDL induced by a ketogenic diet. And of course, our sample size, we'd have to admit, is modest, 100 patients, but um, uh, adequate to answer the question about what we will see as plaque progresses. So we concluded that after a mean duration of 4.7 years with a carbohydrate-restricted uh, diet inducing high LDL, a median of 272 milligrams per deciliter, a metabolically healthy cohort, and that's going to be important, uh, a metabolically healthy cohort of lean mass hyperresponders on a ketogenic diet did not have greater atherosclerotic burden than participants from a population-based uh, cohort with similar risk profiles but markedly lower LDL cholesterol. Again, there was no correlation between LDL and plaque burden, so we did not see a direct relationship where the higher the induced LDL, the more atherosclerosis at baseline will have a one-year follow-up to help, um, to help look at this. So uh, let me just finish up with just uh, this last slide and then we can open up for Q&A. But I, I think that this is um, supporting data in the context of good metabolic health, that high LDL cholesterol may pose less concern, especially when it's induced by ketogenic diet. I don't think it, it eliminates or, or diffuses the lipid hypothesis that in Patients who have uh, metabolic disorders, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, other uh, coronary artery disease, that, that LDL shouldn't be reduced. LDL is, is a modifiable risk factor in the setting of metabolic disease. In the setting of good metabolic health, we did not see a predisposition at least over 4.7 years for more atherosclerosis than, it, than the general population. So poor metabolic health and or existing disease will still need treatment. So with that, I will stop and open up for Q&A. And again, thank you all for your support. Um, and certainly um, uh, glad to answer any questions. And again, apologize for my tardiness. Any questions? Yeah, just say it and I'll repeat it so they can hear it. So a metabolically healthy person, why they might have a low HDL. So uh, HDL is our good cholesterol, and typically it, it's opposite of triglycerides. So triglycerides are usually the fats in our bloodstream. As triglycerides go up, the body processes uh, um, with a couple different enzymes and produces uh, or, or um, uh, metabolizes HDL. So HDL goes down. In the, in the setting of high LDL or VLDL or VLDL or triglycerides. So low HDL is of interest, but we don't fully understand why some people are walking around with very low HDLs. And we tried to treat this. We used niacin, a B vitamin. We've used fibrates. We've used uh, uh, other agents called CETP inhibitors. And no matter what we do for these patients who have very low HDL, we can't seem to improve their cardiovascular outcomes by at least changing it with therapies. Now, exercise, diet uh, may, may have some impact, but, but we don't, I don't think we have the full answer on low HDL. But to be clear, just to not confuse this issue, we only studied patients who had high HDL in this study because that was a sign of good metabolic health. So HDL, good cholesterol goes up, triglycerides are going down, and LDL First, in these patients are going significantly higher, and that's who we studied. What do I? Oh, very low HDL is below 40. I'm sorry. So uh, the definition of low HDL is 40. So as we lower HDL below 40, as, as people are born with or have HDL below 40, that's considered abnormally low. Um, and there are some people walking around with HDL the good cholesterol that takes the plaque, that takes the cholesterol back into the liver for excretion. So there are people walking around with HDLs of 20, which is very, very low. And those people usually have disease. That's, that's not metabolically healthy.
please. Yep, so that's a great question. So the question is, maybe maybe five years, <coughs> excuse me, maybe five years isn't long enough. Maybe we needed to study them for 10 years or 15 years. And I would say, obviously, longer and larger is always better. But I think five years with an extreme LDL elevation, remember, these are not modest changes. These are LDLs on average of 272. This is, this is very, very high, a normal, for, for asymptomatic people is 130. This is more than double that on average. And we had people triple that and quadruple that. So I agree it would be great to have longer term follow up and we're, we're talking about trying to do that and to have even longer follow up in these patients to, to continue to see what happens over time. But I think five years is not insignificant. I think five years of a very high exposure is atherosclerosis can start to form. So we, we haven't looked at endotoxin or LPS yet. We have a, a host of, of labs that we are going to run now that we've completed the study. So we have a lot of blood stored in freezers and we're gonna send for a lot of assays. So you'll hear a lot more about the what's going on at a metabolic level, what's going on at a cholesterol metabolism level, and also looking at some of these other biomarkers of health, please. Wow, great. And can your triglycerides jump around a bit and then your HDL jump around a bit and not show the hard work that you're doing? Yeah, so triglycerides are very variable. So triglycerides do tend to go up and down uh, uh, related to uh, carbohydrates in your diet and other things. So yeah, it's not like a perfect linear line, but overall, as you continue this journey, your LDL, um, um, your, your triglycerides should continue to drop and your HDL should overall continue to go up. But yeah, it might not be a perfectly straight line. Please. Yeah, so, um, so how I became interested, um, actually, uh, 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 partially uh, by meeting uh, Dave and uh, other people, uh, Spencer Nadalski and Nick Norwitz and others uh, in this field, but it's a, it's a problem I face. I'm a preventive cardiologist, so I see these patients in my practice. Uh, I'm in Southern California. Um, shouldn't have been that far a flight, but it seemed to take forever. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was supposed to be 40 something minutes, but um, anyway, um, so um, I became interested because I have patients like this. I have patients who come to see me who have very high LDLs, but they look great, they're thin, they have, they have other, no other risk factors for heart disease, and should they be on lifelong statins? Should I tell them to quit the keto diet and go back to something more moderate because they're having this LDL increase, or is this LDL increase okay? And the literature, is pretty scarce, right? We don't have good data. So I was just trying to answer a clinical question, and I think we're starting to get those answers now. Again, thank you to the Citizen Science Foundation. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so we, we, we think of coronary calcium as somewhat of scar tissue, that it embeds itself in the artery, and it probably will never go from 247 to zero, but we have seen fluctuations in both directions. However, we have seen low scores, early calcifications, go down. And I think we're still learning a little bit about different interventions and what happens to the coronary calcium. So what we generally tell people is our goal, if you have a high calcium score, which means you have plaque in your coronary arteries, is to at least keep it stable. We don't want it going up. If it goes down mildly, that's a win, but we don't always see uh, a reduction. But at least holding the line is great. If it keeps going up, that means you're still laying down plaque in the coronaries, and that's a problem.
So, you know, so why don't we just discard the Lippert hypothesis? And I think we have to remember that the one thing that I think everybody, at least almost everybody in cardiology believes is that if you have heart disease and you treat LDL, regardless of where you start, or at least you use drugs that have been proven to be beneficial, there's very unanimous or very, uh, uh, very similar data across many different data sets. And it's not just from big pharma here in the US. There are data sets and studies that have been done around the world. Australia did a very large trial. Um, Europe did two large trials. Japan did a trial. China has a trial. US has a number of trials. So. I still believe that if you have heart disease, coronary artery disease, LDL is a target to reduce, not to say that it's the cause of the heart disease. So I think you're, there's two things there, right? The lipid hypothesis says LDL automatically causes more heart disease, and I, I don't think that's true. And that's why I showed you that familial hyperlipidemia study, 11,000 patients from Europe, 11,000 patients, mean age 62 years old, who for 62 years had LDLs above 193, and half of them, more than half, never developed heart disease. But once they have heart disease, LDL is our best target of therapy. So it's not our best predictor of who's gonna develop therapy, but it's still a good treatment target once you have therapy, once you have heart disease. And I still believe in if people come to me and they have a heart attack or a stroke or a lot of coronary calcium or, or blockages, <clears throat> I still believe that they would benefit from a statin therapy, not because of their baseline LDL, but because it seems like at that point, once you have disease, lowering LDL or at least using drugs that lower LDL have a beneficial outcome. You live longer you have less inflammation, and, and at least the longer-term studies suggest you might have less cancer as well by being on some of these drugs. So we're still learning, but I think that's the difference between LDL is always bad and LDL should be treated in some cases. At least that's how I see it. Other questions, please? Yeah, so the matched analysis is being done right now. We're, we're analyzing it now to get the true Oh, oh, the match now be this to be published any day, any day. I apologize. I was hoping it would be published by now. Dave and I were told by the journal that it should be out very, very quickly. The uh, abstract that I presented is supposed to be out in Metabolism. They said it should already be out, the journal Metabolism. I haven't seen it yet. And the, the manuscript of this matched analysis is accepted in a journal, but it hasn't been published online yet. But I think any day now, and, and I'll make sure that as soon as I see either one of those, the abstract or the paper, Dave will be the first to know, and the Citizen Science Foundation will be the second to know, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it won't take him long to tweet that out or, or X that out or what do, we, yeah. What do we call it now, Xing it out instead of tweeting it out, or is it a, <laughs> a bit, yeah, you're crossing it out, I don't know. Well, anyway, we'll make sure it gets out. The minute we have it, we'll get it out to everybody, I promise. Yeah, I apologize for the delay, but the publication process is just out of everybody's hands. There's no way to totally control that. We've been trying to expedite that, and hopefully we'll have it soon. Yep. Yep. So, yes, absolutely. So I believe in, I, st I, I like low carb. I, I'm a big believer in it. I'm not quite uh, as good as Dave at being, uh, uh, going into ketosis, but I believe low carb is a great diet because I think carbohydrates contribute to triglycerides and can contribute to storage of fat. And I don't think they're, they're healthy. They cause inflammation, which is probably bad. So I do if they have coronary artery disease. So now they're no longer metabolically healthy. I do try to put them on a statin um, because I believe that that's going to benefit them. I've seen it with my own trials. Um, and I do very comfortably continue their, their low-carb, uh, high-protein diets. Uh, I'm fine with that. Yep. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I have not done that randomized trial yet, but uh, we will definitely put that in the queue for, for a trial. Um, yes. Yep, so, so the genetics 
do show us that overall there is a trend for LDL cholesterol, high LDL cholesterol or ApoB, the bad, ApoB B is bad, so the bad cholesterol is associated <clears throat> genetically with more heart disease. But it's a weak association, which means it's not in everybody. And I think there's what we would say incomplete uh, um, expression. So some people, as I showed you even in that familial hyperlipidemic study, some people had a lot of disease. They had familial hypercholesterolemia, they had a lot of heart disease, and they need to be treated. 6,000 out of 11,000 had no heart disease. And I'd be very comfortable, and in my practice every day, for even FH, I tell them, your score is zero, you don't have plaque, you're not susceptible personally. Mendelian genetics say as a population you're susceptible, but that doesn't translate to the individual. So I believe in personalized medicine. And I'd believe it in this trial too. If I saw a patient, just independent of this study, but if I saw a patient who came in and, and I did a CT, because they were on a keto diet and their LDL was 250 or 300 or 350, and I saw a lot of plaque, I would still tr try to convince them they can continue the keto diet, but I would try to convince them to go on a statin to, to, to help us treat that underlying plaque, because there might be other factors. Remember, cholesterol is one risk factor. We have diabetes, we have high blood pressure, we have smoking, we have other genetics, right? You have family history, right? Your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister had a heart attack. We don't even know what those genes are yet. That's not LDL genes, that's a different genetic predisposition. Those are the people we need to think about. Please. Well, so, yeah, so um, not necessarily true. I think some people have coronary disease and now are metabolically healthy because they're doing all the right things. They might have been metabolically unhealthy at one point to develop heart disease. And that might be true in this study as well, right? We took people five years ago, but they might have had heart disease. And the reason they went on the ketogenic diet is because they had plaque in their coronaries. They didn't know it maybe, but, but because they had a predisposition for heart disease and they were worried about, about heart disease and they went on this diet. So they might have started with disease. Think about a, there's a runner named Jim Fix, right? So Jim Fix, uh, fit for life. So 52 years old, terrible coronary disease, overweight, metabolically unhealthy, started running, did great. He, had a, he looked wonderful, he was running, he was thin, he lost a lot of weight. He ultimately, he did still succumb to heart disease, but he was metabolically healthy. Unfortunately, the damage was already done. So, you know, metabolically healthy is a point in time, I think. Um, I think the cumulative benefit or harm that you might suffer, we have to look back, because some of us didn't have the best diets in childhood, things that we couldn't control, right? Our mom or dad might have been feeding us you know, more trips to McDonald's than other kids, and we might have been building up some plaque and not been metabolically healthy early on, and now we are. So I think it's a, it's a point in time, and that's why I think it all has to be put into context. But, but I think, to me, at least my first impression, and I told this to Dave, I was very surprised to see so many people with no plaque at all. I mean, a lot of people had no plaque. It wasn't like, it wasn't like we were just kind of comparable to Miami Heart. The average, the median calcium score, the middle person, halfway through the study, the 50th person in the trial, had a score of zero, had no plaque in their coronaries, had no segments involved, had all zeros. So it was at least 50% by definition, 50% of the patients in this cohort had no plaque and no evidence of plaque whatsoever. So we might see two different groups evolve from this. We might see those people who have disease, maybe they had disease earlier in life and they weren't metabolically healthy their whole life, and they are gonna progress, and we need to look at those patients differently. And there'll be some of these patients that maybe can go on forever and, and not have to worry about this LDL. And I think the CT scan or another way of looking into the coronaries is gonna be very helpful for an individual to figure out what's the state of my coronaries given this, given this disease. So We're gonna have to yeah. make that the last question. I just, I would like to ask a favor for all of you. I hope you recognize as I have that, and this has been five years in the running. We, we first started talking to Dr. Budoff in 2019. And I don't know if you see it as clearly as I do, how much of an exceptional scientist he is. Would you mind giving him an applause on our behalf for getting this research? Thank you. And 
Thank you very much. And just for the record, I try to be on time. I'm, I'm actually uh, not a tardy person usually, so I do apologize again, but thank you. And Dave, thank you for making this a reality. Uh, you did all the heavy lifting here.